When you start a new project, typically you need things like a domain name, hosting, things like that. When I choose hosting, I pick mine for the options it gives. I like to know what I'm getting and set things up just how I like them. This is why for your projects, you should check out Linode. Linode servers feature native SSD storage, a 40 gigabyte network, and Intel E5 processors. That's all the power you need to run VMs under full control or Docker containers, who doesn't love that? Encrypted disks and VPNs. Plus they have 10 data centers across the world and add-ons like backups, node balancer, and long view to help you control your server costs. They also offer block storage for your static files and you can get started with a $20 credit if you use the code JavaScriptJabber2018. That credit is good for four months on their one gigabyte server. That's a lot of time to try them out and see if they're the right fit for you. That code again is JavaScript Jabber 2018. Also, if you're interested in working for Linode, they're hiring. Head to linode.com slash careers to see their available position. All right. Hey, folks, and welcome to another JavaScript Jabber. This week we are still at Microsoft Build. I guess we're not live anymore because you're going to get a recording of this. But uh, anyway, I'm here with Ori Zohar. You want to say hi? Hello. And... Oh, boy. I, I love these names that are a little bit different. But how do you say your name? Gopinath Chigakagari. Awesome. You can, you can call Gopi. Gopi. All yeah. right. That's Gopi and Ori. Gopi and Ori, yeah. Yeah. So do you want to just introduce yourselves really briefly and tell us uh, what you do at Microsoft? Sure. Uh, so my name is Ori Zohar. I'm in the product team for VSDS, focusing on DevOps, specifically on Azure, on our cloud. Okay. I am Gopi Gopinath, and you can call me Gopi. I am the group program manager in VSTS. Okay. I primarily own continuous integration, continuous delivery, DevOps, Azure deployments. Anything to do with the CI and CD parts mm -hmm. is what I want. Awesome. Well, then we're going to have a lot to talk about because this is something that I'm continually pushing on the show and saying, look, folks, you need to do this. And it's not just from the standpoint of, hey, you know, this is the right way to write code, but I hear people complain that they don't have enough time to get done what they need done, or, you know, there are companies that have trouble finding more people to come work for them or things like that. And I'm like, look, if you can automate away parts of these problems that you have, you know, whether it's CI, CD, so that the deployments happen automatically and you know that there aren't bugs, all the way down to, you know, automation on your machine and how you generate code and how you write code and how you check code and everybody kind of understands that process, which is DevOps, um, then you really get into the area where it's, okay, now the people that I have working for me are just solving the problem, right? They're, they're writing the code. And so, yeah, um, first of all, I just want to clarify, you both said VSTS. I'm not sure everybody that listens knows that VSTS is Visual Studio Team Services, Yep. And that encompasses a lot of tools that allow people to manage their projects. Right. So Visual Studio Team Services is our um, basically suite of services that gives developers the ability to be productive, meaning plan their work, uh, post their code, and do some social coding together, mm -hmm. build their code, um, including continuous integration, automated builds, then deploy that code uh, even do package management, um, create amazing dashboards just to see the whole thing work, mm -hmm. create wikis to share the, all the information and everything. Uh, so it's basically about developer productivity. Right. Yeah. It's a suite of products. It's a suite of services, I would say, yeah. Yeah, it really is. I've, I've played with it a little bit. Um, you know, it's not something that I've used myself on any major projects, but most of my major projects these days are podcasts and not programming. So, um, but, but yeah, I'm curious. So as we get into this, what's kind of the first big step that people should be taking if they're getting into the process management stuff that we're talking about here that DevOps encompasses? Yes. Yeah, so, so I think in Microsoft, um, we define DevOps as the union of people, processes, and technology. Mm -hmm. And this is, we need to say that because when people say DevOps, sometimes they mean different things. Yes, absolutely. Uh, I've heard DevOps being referred to as the guy who does DevOps. It's a mm -hmm. title. Or DevOps is a process. Or DevOps yeah. is a tool. But 
the way we look at it as it's the union of people, processes, and technology. And actually, when we talk about VSTS, we're talking mostly about the technology and the tool. Right. But in Microsoft, in our point of view, it's the people and the processes that are actually more important. Yeah. So you can buy the tool and you can install it and you can tell everybody start using this. Mm -hmm. But if people don't have the culture of being agile, of um, just thinking about being uh, with production mindset, yeah. um, doing automated testing, uh, collaborating in a way where... Um, they're kind of empowering each other and um, just getting all the benefits of working as a team. Then, and you don't have the organizational structure as well right. to support that. Then it doesn't really matter what you do because basically you can really implement a lot of DevOps best practices. And I think mm -hmm. a lot of what we talked about DevOps, like continuous integration, continuous deployment, is just best practices. A lot of it you can really yeah. do in the end with like very simple tools. It's more about the mindset, about the culture, and about the organization kind of embracing that. Yeah, absolutely. It's interesting. I've talked to a number of people about just, you know, automating processes. And it's funny because they're like, oh, yeah, you know, we could write some scripts. And I'm like, no, that's not the point, right? Yeah. It's what are, what are your people doing? And when stuff goes sideways, do they know what to do, right? right? Do you have a process for that? And you can't really code that. You can't CICD your way out of that. You just have to make sure that everybody's on the same page as far as how we do things. And then, yeah, you, you automate the processes that you can with the tools, but you've got to have your people bought into the idea that this is what we do, this is how we do it, and this is what it means. Absolutely. Yeah, I'll just add a couple more points to what Ori mentioned. Things always will go wrong. Right? You know, whatever you do, things will go wrong. But the important part in the DevOps culture is when things go wrong, are people working together? Right. Right. Hey, you know, the ops guys, yes, there is a site down. If my site is down, do I know what I need to do yeah. immediately? Mm -hmm. Do I get that feedback immediately? What's going on now? You know, if I understand, hey, you know, my site is currently down, not working. Right. How can I immediately talk to my developer, you know, or the ops people and get it back up? And how much time does it take for me to, you know, deploy a hot fix to it? If you yep. have not automated all of this, boy, you know, getting your hot fix done and testing it out and deploying it will take a lot more time. Mm -hmm. And the tools... The process, the culture will help you get there. Yep, absolutely. So what, what kinds of things does VSTS or Visual Studio Team Services offer to help people with these processes? Um, yeah, so, so first of all, um, I, I would say if we start at, uh, like, the, like we said, the people in the processes, you really start the, the conversation around planning, right? Mm -hmm. um, and one of the things that we have is just uh, um, a system that lets you do agile planning correctly. So if you're going to implement Scrum or any other kind of agile process where you're mm -hmm. running in sprints, you want to have work items, you want to have Kanban boards, all that stuff, and, and have really good visibility to that, uh, um, then we have that uh, in VSTS. That's, that I would say, the first thing when we kind of start to think about those cycles. Because a lot of DevOps is cycles. It's about... Planning, coding, building and testing, deploying, monitoring, and then getting that feedback to your next plan. So that's the right. cycle. That, so we can definitely start there, right? Uh -huh. Yeah, so that's the, that's the first part. You know, the planning, either you have a new idea that you want to you know, give it to the customers or a customer gave a feedback to you saying that, you know, uh -huh. how do we improve this feature? It all starts that place. Right. And, you know, that, that second point is about the coding and obviously... We want most of our developers as much as possible, you know, because we are paying big bucks to them. How can we just, you know, optimize their time focusing on adding more features, more yeah, features, exactly. more features, and automating the remaining things. Mm -hmm. That includes automatically building it, automatically testing it, automatically deploying it. So that at the end of the day, most of developers, you know, time is spent only on, you know, features, mm -hmm. our debugging, than these things. Let the yeah. system... Now, the system can be running in the cloud or yep. the system can be running in your on-prem system. Let that system take care. I think that's uh -huh. the key value problem. That's the key problem that we would like to solve. Well, and you're talking about it from like a business or team standpoint, right? Where it's, yeah, you know, let's have our developers working on the things that 
we're getting paid to deliver to our customers, right? But as a developer, I'm also looking at it and going, I don't want to worry about what's going on in production. Yep. You know, I don't, I don't want to worry about any of that stuff. I want to push it up. I want the CI machine to come back to me and say, hey, you screwed this up, fix it. I mean, but that's it, right? Yep. The, the rest, I don't want to worry about the rest of that stuff. You know, the, I want the planning to be easy, painless, and short. And so if the tools allow you to do all of those things, I mean, that's, that's what we're looking for. Right. I, I think a, a big trend of, of this whole DevOps, um, embracing DevOps in organizations and, and by, by different developers is also kind of moving, kind of shift lefting the responsibility. So developers uh -huh. are actually becoming more responsible to production. Like you say, right. that is not where developers want to be. They want to code, they want to yep. move fast, and they don't want to worry about production. So that is a great incentive to automate stuff. Oh, and 100%. 100%. <laughs> so I think like as a, when I was uh, mostly a developer, now I'm not doing that as much, mostly focusing on product. But when I was a developer, the last thing I wanted was to have something break somewhere else and me to stop yeah. doing what I'm doing, check it out, debug it, see what happened. So the best way around it was actually to add all the info I needed, like as telemetry, mm -hmm. uh, make sure this thing is like robust and never fails, do a bunch of tests for it. So I can kind of forget about it and move to the next thing that's actually more interesting. Yep. And that is a huge incentive. Once you do that shift left, and that's part of the cultural thing we've, we've mentioned, yep. Um, you're actually telling your developers, guys, you're you're going to be the the guys. We're going to wake up if something goes wrong in production. Yeah, there is nothing uh, more in insensitizing uh, to to developers to to do good coding than the fact that they're going to be woken up. And this is actually <laughs> Gopi can yeah, and Gopi can talk more about this because this is exactly what's happening in the VSTS team, which is VSTS is actually a SaaS, right? So it's running Correct. all the time uh -huh. over the world, and it's in production. Yeah, so now I'll just tell you maybe a story. I'll start with a story so people can understand. And these are real customer stories, right. right? I think this is pre-DevOps days. You know, the, the way people used to work on, you know, one of the person, you know, he, has, he was added a feature and then the feature was done, completed, and he kept all of his feature code on his hard disk. Uh -huh. Okay? He was not using a version control system. Oh, he no. created a package. And then deployed the package. He gave it to the ops guys. Ops guys deployed the package. Everything is working fine. Right. And then he went on vacation. Oh, no. <laughs> and then, you know, customer, you know, tried it. Uh, actually, you know, before he went on vacation, customer tried it. Everything is working. Then he went on mm -hmm. vacation. Right. But customers needed a small change in it because they were blocked on, you know, somewhere inside. Right. Now they call, you know, them and then asking that, hey, you know, I'm blocked on it. Can you just help me solve this problem? I said, yeah, sure, we will solve it. The management, that's what management right. knows. And then they mm -hmm. said, yes, we will solve it. We will give it to you. They find out that this guy has gone to Hawaii. To where? To Hawaii. Oh, nice. So he's having fun there. I don't blame him. And he get a call <laughs> from his manager. Yeah. Do you have your laptop? No. Fly back now. Oh, man. <laughs> so that's the real story. That's horrible. <laughs> right? And it's not good. And obviously, yeah. the developers, he worked hard. He just completed yep. everything. But the cycle of part of the DevOps is where, can I just make sure my source code is in a version control system? Yep. Can I make sure there is a you know automated pipeline that is available to do the testing, yep. building, and deploying is a super, super important. Yep, At I least agree. in this, this new era of where you know things are moving super fast, where and if you're not doing it, your competition might start mm -hmm. doing some of these practices. Yeah. So at the end of the day, reaching value to the customers as fast as possible is important. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and, and we're, if we're going to get into talking about CI and CD, you know, which is continuous integration, which I, I've heard people using it for different things. But generally what I see is, you know, runs tests, run builds, um, you know, any linting or other, you know, code tools that, you know, don't really fall under either of those other two that are part of your process, you know, that you can automate, get run as part of the CI pipeline. Um, you know, all of that stuff is feedback that right. you get before you push to production. Right. So then you don't have to get called in the middle of the night because production isn't broken. Right. It's just your, your continuous integration build went red. Right. And so you just come in the next day and fix it. Right. 
Yeah, and, and I think continuous integration uh, also takes out a lot of the risk that we know integration kind of inherently has. Yeah. If you've ever been a developer, you know that the one thing that people don't really account for very well uh, in terms of like planning and the time they give it is integration. Everybody assumes yeah. everything's just going to work together when different teams or different people work on it, but then you come to bring it all together and it breaks. Yeah. Uh, and the idea is that with continuous integration, you are constantly integrating into the main or master branch. Mm -hmm. uh, so it's a lot of small changes. You fail fast, right. going to Gopi's point. Uh, you realize you're failing fast. And with things like, um, uh, for example, branch policy that we have in mm -hmm. VSTS, where you can enforce that you have to um, um, pass a certain amount of tests before you can even commit your code. Uh, then you know that um, that master is always right. stable and that any changes are actually small changes. So you don't have a lot of risk at the end of the development cycle mm -hmm. where you're like, oh, now I need to bring everything together and we're not going to meet the deadline because and customers are not going to see this feature because uh, we need to work out why, why it's not coming in together. So. Yeah, absolutely. Well, and... Yeah, the other the other end of integration isn't just integrating my code into the main code base, but also all of the things that I wrote that have to talk to stuff that other people wrote. Absolutely. And and I'll tell you, other people write crappy code. Now, my code's fine, <laughs> but their code sucks. And so if they if they don't do it right, then when I commit, there's going to be a problem, and I want to know that right, so that I can go get on their case, or so that I can you know just make it work, you know, and not make them feel bad about how bad their code is, and so. You know, yeah, it it really gets you around not just to the integration of my code into the main code base, but also my code with your code. Yep, and actually, some more trends that we're seeing, things that customers are asking for, are even at these stages. Let's incorporate security best practices. For example, mm -hmm. I want to scan the code that you're gonna commit to make sure. I'm not introducing new vulnerabilities. Oh yeah. Or even IP stuff. Like I don't mm -hmm. I want to make sure I'm safe in terms of a legal thing. Like I don't yeah. want to include things that I'm not allowed to include there. So mm -hmm. there's a lot of um, solutions out there that allow you to even scan code uh, against like whitelists or blacklists yep. or just like look at in, in patterns and stuff like that. Uh, one of the things that we know is is a big trend now is containers, Docker containers. Mm -hmm. That is a whole bunch of new vulnerabilities. Every technology yep. that comes in introduces oh, yeah. new stuff. So you want to scan that container. Does that container really have what I think it has? Yep. Um, does the registry it comes from is something I know about and is approved? Mm -hmm. Is it signed? What is actually happening when it's running? I want to look at the system and see yep. it's not doing things it's not supposed to be doing. All that I want to do before I even let you put your code inside because I don't want to um, yep. introduce vulnerabilities. This is extremely important, especially um, in in certain organizations where there's like, yep. um, you know, government organizations or mm -hmm. there's compliance issues and so on. Yeah. Well, I mean, I, I was talking to some of the guys at one of the booths over here in the on the show floor, you know, one of the sponsors of the conference. And yeah, they were talking about um, that their, their vulnerabilities in Docker images off of Docker Hub. And yep. so, yeah, so you deploy your Docker image up with your app on it and somebody's mining cryptocurrency on, on your machine or something, yep. right? And you just, you, you don't need that. You're paying for the compute time. You don't want to, yeah. So that makes a lot of sense. And then you've also got things like the Node Security Project, right? Where they go look at the Node packages and make sure that there are no vulnerabilities in those packages. And I think a lot of times we just take for granted that what we pull off of NPM is okay. Yeah. Right? And the reality is, is, it's code too, right. and it's written by people who are just as bad at writing code as I am. <laughs> right? And so, you know, there, there's no guarantee. And so if they find a vulnerability, yeah, I want it to say, hey, no, roll it back a version until they fix this bug. Right. Or you're using an old version, and they've already fixed this bug. So, you know, up, update your package.json file and, and make it work. And, yeah, that, that makes a ton of sense too. And, yeah, why, why would you want to have to catch that in production? Exactly. You yeah. want to do what we call, and I think I mentioned this, shift left. Just always yep. catch it as soon as possible. Yep. And I think there's a, a, a really interesting tension because 
the world is moving towards open source. And oh, we totally. Do, and we do want to, we don't want to lock ourselves in. We want to, you know, leverage that amazing ability to get like a lot of value from people outside the organization, people I don't know, people yep. who are great coders who solve problems that I don't want to solve again. Yep. Uh, but with that, there's like all these vulnerabilities. So it's yep. a, an interesting tension that I want to keep myself safe, but I want to take advantage of all this yeah. goodness out oh, there. Oh, yeah. So this thing, this is actually a trend that we hear more and more referred to as DevSecOps, mm -hmm. where we're kind of looking into those things. Um, and at Microsoft, that's definitely top of mind for us as yep. uh, part of the roadmap, by the way, for Visual Studio Team Services yep. and our developer tools. Uh, and also for Azure, our cloud as well, yep. of course. Need to create a complex enterprise Angular application? Angular Bootcamp is an intensive three-day workshop class to learn the basics of Angular through sophisticated techniques for real-world applications. We target Angular 6 and the recent versions with much of the curriculum is suitable back to Angular 2. Or go beyond the three-day class with a consultation or project launch with Oasis Digital, the team behind Angular Bootcamp. We can assist your team or launch your project with advanced Angular topics, including scalability, data flow, state management, full stack product design, and more. Contact us for a private class at your location or buy a ticket for public classes in various cities around the U.S. and occasionally in Europe. Online live instructor training is also available at angularbootcamp.com. Uh, so, the, the, the worries okay. point, just to add a couple more things. As the tension is there in two ways. One is developers want to be like radicals. They want their productivity to be super fast. Hey, you know, why should I just build it? There is already a function that's available. Let uh -huh. me just download and use it. Whereas the enterprises and primarily in the financial health, you know, right. they want to be super, super careful on what mm -hmm. modules that they are using. Now, they want to enforce process. They want to enforce only these policies, mm -hmm. these modules, you know, are allowed to be used. These open source versions right. are allowed to use. Now, where do you draw this line? I think that's where the shift left comes in, right? Yeah. If the policies can be defined and then made it available as early as possible, like in continuous integration, why mm -hmm. at least you are helping it. Yeah. And if you don't do it that way, I have seen many cases where developers spend time, you know, they write all of these functions. They think it is done. It goes, you know, almost to the staging and somebody monitors and then said, no, we are not allowed to use these libraries. Go back, mm -hmm. work again. Yeah. It's painful. Because those enterprises have some strict criteria, some of them. Now, that balance, you know, how do you just, you know, make this super easy is the yep. shift left. Try to push it as far left as possible. Right. Absolutely. So, um, how does Visual Studio Team Services give you tools that do this? And how do you configure the continuous integration so that you know, okay, it's going to run these things. I mean, I've seen like .yaml files or .json files in repositories. I've seen... Um, you know, visual setup. I think Jenkins has a visual setup, you know, where you pick the tasks. How does it work in, in DSTS? So, you know, I think there are multiple ways, you know, that we support it. The first thing is, yes, you can just create a YAML file as your build definition. Mm -hmm. And that YAML file, you know, you can check it into the version control system, yep. which is available for everybody to see what needs to be mm -hmm. done as soon as the check-in happens. Yep, that's what GitLab does. That's what GitLab does. You know, that's what you know, we recommend yep. the YAML yeah. way. We also have a UI way of solving this too, where you can just create a set of tasks. We call it as a build definition. Mm -hmm. Build definition is like a set of tasks or a, you know, steps that you want to perform. First step can be a pull in my sources. Second step is pull in my NPM packages, build it, run tests, and create artifacts and then publish it. Right. Right. So that's one way of achieving it. The second way we are also even taking it, you know, a little bit even more further, integrating with the pull request. If you are already using a Git based one, mm -hmm. uh, you know, if that's what you like, how can I just make sure that before even my code gets merged into the master, can I be clean? Right. Can I come out clean? Mm -hmm. So you can create a branch and a pull request policy and then say, every merge, can I automatically do build? Can I run this set of unit tests? Right. So that will make the life even more mm -hmm. easier. So in case of ESTS, we have a pull request based policies you can create. You can create a continuous integration and protect yourself. Right. The next one is in the release management, just like build definition, you can create a release definition. Even that we are considering like YAML based story mm -hmm. there too, where you can say, you know, let me just deploy it and then start running my functional tests. Right. And you can create an environment. You can try to achieve it. 
and mm-hmm. if my you know deployment is successful my functional tests are successful let me take it to the next stage right. let me deploy to you know staging or a pre production mm-hmm. and do load testing yep. because you know i'm just going to get x number of users yep right you can just simulate all of these before it goes to the production yep to you know stop as many issues as possible in every stage yep that's what vsts supports fully Yeah, and just to add to that, so if we double-click on the tasks that Gopi mentioned, we can put in this build definition. We actually have a huge variety of tasks that we support uh, right out of the box. And mm-hmm. actually, if you're missing something, we have a huge ecosystem of partners and basically an open marketplace where you can just click and basically find, I think, everything you would even ever imagine, I think. Right. Right. Um, Be- and if you don't find that you can actually write your own extension and mm-hmm. create your own task uh basically anything that can be run from um a shell uh a command line uh you can make into a a, a step in a build definition and share it with the world actually right um, so we have a lot of partners who are doing that we have a lot of developers who are doing that that goes by the way uh um also for our release definitions which mm-hmm. is the cd part of it right uh and there you can find steps like deploy to the apple app store mm-hmm. um orcas you mentioned jenkins for ci we can even orchestrate jenkins we can have use jenkins endpoints if some by some reason you want to start up a jenkins process somewhere mm-hmm. in a, another um machine you can do that uh obviously integrations with docker you can push images you can pull images you can right. build images just i think around 500 more than 500 solutions in the marketplace alone and of course you can write your own right awesome. those tasks are actually open source you can actually see all the built in tasks that we build are open source available on github mm-hmm. and i think one of the great benefits there is also our deep integration with azure so yeah yeah so we have like a, a lot of tasks just perfect for azure just mm-hmm. targeting specific services uh whether it's web apps virtual machines uh our different databases mm-hmm. like uh sql database and uh, cosmos db cosmos db and of course kubernetes now yep. uh we just uh previewed uh support for helm uh by the way uh if you're using containers and you're deploying to kubernetes mm-hmm. um and this is just amazing cuz together with the support of a managed kubernetes cluster that you have on azure yeah. aks the uh azure kubernetes service mm-hmm. and these kind of uh integrations for deployment and also by the way with the monitoring that we just announced at build for containers on aks Yeah. You have basically the best Kubernetes experience in any cloud on mm-hmm. Azure, which is amazing, I think. Yeah, and and I think for me, you know, we're talking about DevOps and we're also talking about Azure. And I think traditionally when people think about DevOps, a lot of times they're just thinking about kind of the deployment and production picture. But, you know, to me DevOps really is kind of the entire workflow process, you know, and how it integrates with your people and you know and your tools and things like that you know like you said before and and so as you're looking at this and you go okay well as i go through these stages right with continuous integration if i'm deploying to azure i mean testing in azure makes a ton of sense because then everything that i am trying to do is being run in an environment that looks exactly like my production environment right. and that way i i don't have to goof around Oh, do I have a staging server set up? Okay, now I'm going to throw all this stuff at it, blah blah blah. I don't have to worry about that because I can just automate it all through Azure and it just works. And then I deploy it to Azure and I know it's going to act kind of the same. Right. Absolutely. And I think also like a lot of the benefits of of using the cloud for dev test and as well as production is a the scalability, uh-huh. right? I don't need to buy hardware. I don't need to find a place to host my thing. Yeah. I can just on demand pay just for what you mm-hmm. use um that's one thing just the scalability yep. and the ability to play with it i want to turn it on uh maybe just for dev and test i need like a couple of machines or a couple of services for production i want to make mm-hmm. this thing robust and right. have like dozens of servers or dozens yeah. of web apps out there uh so that's one thing another thing is basically 
I get a lot of the management for free yeah. out of yeah, the box. That's the biggest. Yeah. That's the biggest one, right? So of course everybody knows virtual machines. You can set up a virtual machine, SSH into it, or uh, log in and install your stuff and do whatever. But actually, you can use a lot of our mm -hmm. PaaS services, yeah. platform as a service, and just not worry about that. Because like <laughs> I think that what we said in the beginning, like developers are looking just for to code. They yeah. Don't, they don't want to yep. manage all that stuff and. And then you have to also kind of look after all these uh, different services, but we have monitoring built in. Mm -hmm. So you don't even have to switch anything on. You're getting metrics, right. alerts, alerts uh, logs with Azure Monitor, with Log Analytics, with Application Insights, mm -hmm. which is just something you turn on and you get full visibility and create like, you can create actually really cool dashboards um, and just get all the monitoring for free right. without putting any work in there. And just do the thing that you came here to do, which is write your code. You don't need to manage the infrastructure. Um, and I think that's, a, that's the great promise of the cloud. By the way, you're also yep. getting, because Azure is today servicing over 90% of uh, Fortune 500 companies, you're getting all the certifications that these guys require for your stuff. So right. even if you're a simple developer, you don't know much about security. You don't know, like, I'm not going to be compliant to all these ISO mm -hmm. whatevers. Right. But because Azure needs to kind of service like Bank of America and like right. a bunch of other kind of different uh, customers, I get that out of the box. So that's that's right. awesome. Right. So then the only thing that I have to make compliant is my own code. Exactly. Yeah. And the more you kind of make use of our managed services, mm -hmm. the less you need to worry about that yep. stuff. So instead of like running a database on a VM, if you just make use of Cosmos DB or SQL yeah. uh, database on Azure, then you know you don't need to worry about that. Uh, you just get an yeah. SLA, by, by the way. Yeah, and then you just turn on the encryption features or whatever you need to match up you know, with whatever it is that you're doing. Exactly. Um, I do want to hit uh, continuous deployment here for a minute. And a lot of folks that I talk to, you know, I'll talk to them for five or ten minutes about continuous integration. And they'll be like, yeah, we should probably do that. And then I start talking to them about continuous deployment and they freak <laughs> out, right? Because it's, well, I can't push code to production just willy-nilly, right? And, you know, and our, or they'll tell me, and this always makes me laugh because they're like, well, our deployments take, you know, all day. You know, we, we, we build for, you know, two weeks, three weeks, a month three months and then we deploy and then we have to sit there and we have to babysit the thing for a week. You know, this is the worst I've heard, you know, they deploy every three to six months and they have to babysit it for a week. And I'm like, yeah, but if you were deploying every day or a couple of times a day, it would become so routine right. that you just wouldn't have these problems and nobody believes me. Well, I wouldn't say nobody, but a lot of folks, they still just can't see their way there. So, so how do you talk somebody around to that? So if you look at VSTS, in fact, VSTS, we, would, we, we have daily deployments, including some of them can be hot fixes, some of them can be big features mm -hmm. going on on a continuous basis. Right. It's not just, you know, VSTS. If you look at Azure, we have daily deployments. And any of the big companies, you know, Facebook, Google, they are doing continuous changes on every day. Yeah. Because that's what is the new norm now. Yeah. You know, you want, you know, if there is a customer who is waiting for this feature, he's not going to wait for three months or six months. Right. Right. If, you know, if you just say, hey, you know, it's going to take six months, he'll move on to your next, uh, you know, whatever competition product that is available. Mm -hmm. How do you just achieve it like super fast? Yeah. And the second thing is, you know, daily deployment doesn't mean all new features need to daily go to your right. production. Mm -hmm. Right. It's about incremental. I just yeah. have done this, you know, smaller change for helping a specific customer yeah. or I did a hot fix or I did this small feature. Those can just go on a continuous basis. Yeah. The other recommendation that we have are internally we practice daily deployments is you deploy daily to your staging, you know, all the way until uh -huh. staging. Right. Right. Production, you can batch it up and then do on a weekly cadence or whatever way. Mm -hmm. But at least if you can just deploy on a continuous basis to your dev, QA, and staging at least, then it'll just, you know, cover you off. Oh, you know, I don't need to monitor. I don't need to babysit my deployments. Yeah. Because that's really bad. If, you know, if you are just going to, you know, babysit, you know, what happens to, 
you know, heavy workloads whenever you want to deploy, then you just cannot, yeah. you know, monitor and just make sure that, oh, you know, is my deployment going through? Is the VMs app? That's mm -hmm. just not going to help. That's where the CD system of yeah. you automating the pipeline will bring you the reliability. And you will have that problem probably, you know, in the first week or two weeks. Mm -hmm. But afterwards, it becomes a new norm where you trigger, you go home, have your dinner, your deployment is done. You will yeah. get a notification saying that, yes, deployment is done. You go check. If everything is good, mm -hmm. you can turn on the lights so that it can be available to others too. Yeah. Yeah. And I think uh, continuous deployment, it, it sounds cool. It sounds scary, right? Um, well, if you've I, never done it before, of course, it sounds insane. Of course. But, but I think the fact that you're deploying all the time doesn't mean you don't have control. Right. And it doesn't mean that um, you're not kind of smart about it. And what I mean, and just to touch some, some, something that Gopi mentioned, he mentioned staging. So you can definitely have several mm -hmm. environments. And as you grow your confidence and what's deployed in each environment, you let it kind of push forward. So right. by the time it gets to production, you already seen this thing run in mm -hmm. several environments and you kind of have a lot of confidence in it. So it's kind right. of moving along, being tested. It's kind of sitting there. You're seeing it in different scenarios, in, assuming you have a lot of tests. So that's one dimension of it. But even once it's in production, you can have a lot of control. And the mm -hmm. way we do... Um, we do this in, a, in mostly like in, in all our Azure services, but in other services as well, specifically also in VSTS, we have different tiers. So right. our different customers are kind of um, spread out across several tiers. Mm -hmm. So you deploy to the first tier, and then that is like, let's say 10% of your customers are seeing this. So even if you have a terrible failure, it's contained. Only 10% of your people are going to see it. Once it sits there for like 24 hours, 48 hours, people are using the system, real customers right. using it. And you, again, grow your confidence in that change. You can move it to the next year. So an additional amount of customers is going to see it. Mm -hmm. And as it grows on and on and on, yep. you can um, gain more, more and more confidence. And by the way, another, another thing, another practice that you can do is something called... Um, Feature flags. So what are feature I flags? I was actually going to ask, do you do this with feature flags? Yeah, yeah, so VSDS uses feature flags. And what a feature flag is, basically, and that goes, by the way, it, it also helps with continuous integration. Uh, basically, you're building the new code alongside the old code. Right. And you have a little kind of branching thing, like a little if statement. If this flag is on, then use the new code. If it's off, use the old code. Right. And that flag is maintaining a database. And yep. it can be uh, as granular as a, as a specific user. Uh -huh. So that also kind of removes the connection between when that code is in your system right. than when customers see it. Mm -hmm. Meaning, for example, build. We now announced a bunch of stuff. Right. We needed the ability to turn everything on the minute Scott Guthrie talked about it. <laughs> oh wow but have the confidence that uh -huh. it's going to work as if it's been out there for like right a few weeks a few months even mm -hmm. now how do you do that you disconnect this dependence right between when customers see something right. and when it's actually in the system right. so basically if you're building the code and that feature flag is off and you're kind of adding stuff from the from day one because some some features, mm -hmm. by the way, are do not fit into one sprint. Right. It's like multiple months of work. Oh yeah. But you want to start seeing the um, memory footprint, for example. Uh huh. The different packages. You don't want to see any contradiction. It's part of the integration yeah. challenges, right? So if yep. you're it's part of your if you're doing continuous integration, you're actually putting that in very early, but. It's not, mm -hmm. it's not affecting the experience because right. it's, it's off, right? Um, then once you, you kind of do roll it out and you kind of turn it on, you can also do this in several ways. You know, I, I think a lot of people know by now and are used to the fact that you go into some service that's in your web browser and it tells you, hey, we got a new experience for you. Do you want to try it out? Uh -huh. So that's kind of like an opting in to an experience. This is basically you 
controlling that feature flag, turning it right. on for yourself. Yep. And if you don't like it or it breaks or something, you can always go back. So you yep. can kind of roll back yourself. This is a user thing. Then the next step you, you want to do is maybe an opt out kind of thing. Like mm -hmm. let's say you are seeing the new experience. If you want to yep. go back to the old experience, click here and then you can turn yourself back. And once you have enough confidence about that, you can just like remove the old experience yep. in general. So you can have a lot of control, whether it's with different environments or in production in different tiers. And mm -hmm. even inside those tiers, use feature flags uh, to just let everybody control what they're seeing and yep. kind of decouple these dependencies. Yeah, I've also seen companies do it where they enable the new features for internal users yeah. or with certain partners, right, who are willing to kind exactly. of dog food and some of this stuff. That's a great point because everything I said is like things that we see with like SaaS, right, software uh -huh. as a service. But look at Windows, okay? Yep. Windows is a huge product with a lot of features. Yep. I don't know if, you, if everybody listening knows this, but we have an insider program. Uh -huh. So you can sign up to get like early releases of stuff. And this is basically you kind of opting in to yeah. an earlier tier where you're going to see stuff. And Windows is getting a lot of telemetry, a lot of data. And yep. that's going to kind of give more stability to the next tier. So it's actually how they do it with something that's actually yep. installing your device and not in the web browser. Yeah. I also want to go back to something else that you mentioned when we were kind of digging into continuous delivery and it, you basically were talking about you know going through the process for the different I, you both talked about this going through the process for each small feature or you know even a even the bigger features but yeah you know so it it almost sounded to me like if you're not comfortable with continuous deployment maybe you need to shore up your process to the point where you trust it yeah right and then once you trust that every feature that we're going to roll out goes through this process and the process is rigorous enough for us to be confident when we deploy it that it'll deploy correctly and work well, yeah, then continuous deployment becomes a lot less scary, right? Oh, well, it went through all these steps and I know that it's very likely okay. Yeah, absolutely. You need to, you need to decide what is your criteria yeah. for I trust this thing. Mm -hmm. and do whatever it takes to meet yeah. that criteria. If it means more environments, more stages, yeah. then do that. And I think I want to go back to something Gopi said at the very beginning. Things are always going to fail. Yeah. Even <laughs> you, if you do all the stuff we mentioned, you are going to get failures. Why? Yeah. Sometimes it's not your fault. Sometimes there's a power outage. Sometimes it's, it is your fault because code is what is complicated. Things yeah. are complicated. There are dependencies. It's hard. So it's, it's also about failing fast. And failing yep. fast is about, uh, first and foremost, understanding there's a failure. So yep. on top of all of that, even if you say, like, this is how I know I trust this thing, let's make sure that I have the telemetry, the alerting, mm -hmm. all the monitoring I need to know that something goes wrong. I want to see stuff and yep. know it before my customers see it or before a lot of my customers. I don't, right. don't want to get angry tweets or angry emails or support requests. Mm -hmm. I want to know this before they see it. So the more you have that, the more actually confident you're going to be, yep. I think. Well, the other thing is, is that none of this is set in stone. I keep telling people this because a lot of times people are like, well, should I learn JavaScript or Ruby or some other language, you know, or something like that? And it's like, well, if it doesn't work for you, you can switch, right? Yep. And it's the same thing with your process. And I think, I think this is the other thing that people leave off of agile, right? It's like, oh, we're doing stand up meetings and we're we're doing estimation meetings. And you've got to do the retrospectives too, where it's, you know what? We had a process, we were pretty confident in the process, but it failed us big time right here when we released this feature. And so you go back and you say, okay, well we're gonna shore up the process by adding this to it. Right. Yeah. And things like that. Right. And then and then you can become more confident. So it it's always going to be a work in progress too. Absolutely. We, we actually refer to this as the DevOps journey. Right. Uh -huh. We're always on a journey. We are on a journey. The team yeah. that is building these tools that is creating VSTS is on that journey. We're always uh, making things better and yep. improving the process. I actually did this exercise with, with a bunch of customers, and I think it is super useful. Um, you put people in a room. It's called value stream mapping. It's actually from the uh, school of uh, manufacturing. 
Like oh, lean cool. manufacturing, yep. if you know what that is. So you look at and and so I take all the people in the room and everybody who has uh-huh. something to do with the with the product. You put them in the room and you tell them, "I'm an outsider. Please walk me through the process from you have an idea for a feature, all the way until your customer uses it." Yeah. And we try to do it as the as the smallest granularity we can. And for each step, we list. Who can do that process? How long does it take? What is the rate of failure? Yeah. And if it fails, how further back do you have to go uh, to kind of come back? Yeah. So even just going over that stuff, people are like, oh, my God, I can't believe this is how we're working. Because mm-hmm. whether you like it or not, you have a process. Even if yep. you never drew it, you never defined it, you have a process. Yep. It's just like, uh, you know going to this guy's cubicle and asking him to do this and downloading the code and yep. SSHing there and doing this. You, this is a process. Okay. It might be yep. not, not written anywhere and you're not being aware of it. Uh, it's not being explicit, but um, you have a process. So even mm-hmm. just doing that exercise, you're like, Oh my God, I can't believe we're doing that thing. But after you do that process and you kind of realize, okay, this specific part fails like 50% of the time. And it throws us all the way back to the beginning where we have to like create a new branch or start the yep. development all over again. If we just improve that as a bottleneck, our productivity and our confidence in our code is mm-hmm. going to just shoot up. Yep. So there's always places to improve. If you can prioritize by doing this kind of exercise, it's amazing what you can do with just a few simple things. You don't need oh, to yeah. go continuous integration, continuous deployment from day one. Right. Sometimes it's just automating this thing, writing some more tests over there writing another script there, uh, Mm -hmm. having some monitoring service running here. That's all you need. And it it really depends on your process and your product. Yeah, I'm pretty well convinced that it follows the the 80-20 rule or the Pareto principle, right? Where, you know, you're going to, you're going to, yeah, it's going to be a number of small things. And those small things are going to be the hinges that turn, you know, make the 80% move. Sure. And, and yeah, it's all know. about optimization, really. Yeah. DevOps is really a, yeah. an exercise in optimization, yeah. which is why I also tell some people, I think if you're a developer, you know this, never optimize too early, right? Before <laughs> right. you get the thing right, yes. don't optimize it because uh-huh. you're optimizing errors or bugs yeah. or whatever. Yeah. But, so, but that's what you were talking about before. What is every little step we take to get to where we're getting, right? right. Now we know where we are. And we know where the problems are. So, yeah, so we can tweak these pieces and then optimize those for the greatest benefit. Exactly. And you got to start somewhere. And if you're, you're starting from somewhere that is completely manual and not yeah. process driven, that's fine. That's great. Like, do whatever it takes to move forward. Yeah. But as you move forward, you're going to see that you're going to need process. Like, I, so I, I, I'm from Israel and I worked with uh-huh. a lot of startups, has a lot of startups in Israel. Right. Um, um, when I worked at the Microsoft offices there. And you even see it with startups. So everybody assumes startups are the most agile. They're most like, they move the fastest. Not mm-hmm. like they know how to fail fast. They, they pick themselves up. They, they break things. They move fast. But, Sometimes that's all true, but they don't have the baggage. Well, exactly. That's <laughs> why. Well, absolutely. Absolutely. And, and that's fair. But the thing is that once they become, they start being successful, like they have that first customer. Yep. Suddenly, oh, wow. If something breaks, that's my only customer. I have yep. production now. Now I need to think about how I stabilize things before I move it over. Yep. There. And what's going to happen with the next customer? I need yep. to onboard them. Suddenly they, they see that. They are, it's like success is their enemy suddenly because they're, mm-hmm. they're succeeding faster than they can kind of, because yep. especially with the cloud now, right? We mentioned this, like you can create, like uh, you can be like four people in a garage mm-hmm. and have hundreds of virtual machines running a Kubernetes cluster and having like Cosmos DB running millions of transactions. It's just like four people. Right. And you need to manage that thing. You need to make sure that thing is stable and your code, all the changes you're, inter- you're introducing are not breaking everything. Right. Suddenly, you need process. You find, you, I need process. I need DevOps. Like it's yep. not enough to move fast and break things. I'm becoming a serious uh, product or a serious yep. company. So, Yeah, exactly. I mean, you, you have constraints, like you said, from your customers. You have constraints because you have technical debt. You have cons- you know, and all of those things are going to slow you down. And the trick is, is to, yeah, to figure out what your processes are and automate them and, you know, and um, 
basically stay agile. You yeah. want to stay agile. Yeah. You but, want to be but like make them the as g- efficient as possible so right. that you can move forward. Optimization. Yep. Yep. Um, we do need to wrap up. One thing that we do as part of our shows, just to kind of give a little bit of flavor to them at the end, is we do picks. Do you run your own freelance business? Or maybe you're thinking about picking up some business on the side. Well, then you need FreshBooks. FreshBooks is the quickest and easiest way to get invoices out to your clients. It's easy to use. It works anywhere, available from any device, uh, on the desktop, iPhone, iPad, Android, and all of your data is backed up and secure. And it makes it really easy to get organized and get paid. You'll be tracking time, logging expenses, and invoicing your clients in no time. You can also save time billing, freeing up several days per month to focus on the work that you love, and you get paid faster. FreshBooks customers are paid on average five days faster because there's a link on the invoice that says pay me now. And it's a great way to grow your business. Plus, FreshBooks is offering a 30-day trial. That's right, 30-day trial if you try them out. So go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. Once again, for a 30-day trial, go to gofreshbooks.com slash devchat and enter devchat in the how did you hear about us section. I'll go ahead and go first to kind of give you an example. Um, so one thing that I do want to shout out about is uh, .NET Rocks and um, Barat from Microsoft. Uh, they, they lined this whole thing up for us. Um, you know, I've done this the last few years, both at Microsoft uh, Build and Microsoft Connect. And uh, anyway, it's just been a terrific experience. And uh, this is the second year that Build's been at, in uh, Seattle. And it's been kind of fun to just be up here and, and visit Seattle. Um, a couple of other things that I'm going to pick, um, and this is just audio equipment that we're sitting here talking on right now. So, uh, and incidentally, they didn't need my equipment this time. I brought it, but they didn't need it. So uh, that, that's been kind of nice. But I'm talking on a Shure SM58 microphone. Um, I need to find out what brand you two are using because you have the over-the-ear um, mics that come out kind of in front of your face, and I really want to get a couple of those for, for my stuff. But uh, we're talking essentially being recorded into a Zoom H6 um, recording system. And I say recording system. It's a digital audio recorder, but it has equalizers and all kinds of features in it, and it's almost like a studio in a box. So... Um, I just, I really love mine. Um, and there are some, there are some accessories I want to get for it, but yeah, um, it's a terrific little piece of hardware and it's what I use to record all of the recordings that I did at NGConf and NG Atlanta. And I'm trying to get out to FluentConf to do some recordings out there. So anyway, I'm just going to shout out about the, the audio equipment cause I think it's cool stuff. Uh, Ori, do you have some stuff you want to shout out about? Uh, yeah, sure. So I, uh, as I said, I'm from Israel. I recently moved to Seattle. So I moved uh-huh. like late October, which is the worst time to move to Seattle because you're just experiencing all the winter. Right. I'm not used to that. I'm com- coming from a sunny place. Um, and also, I, I, so, so for me, like we were just talking before we started recording, it's, it's start, starting to be sunny in Seattle, uh-huh. which is great. Uh, and it's fun to go out and, and get outside. For me, because I live in Seattle now, I don't actually have a car. First time in 15 years. Oh, wow. So I got this Fitbit, uh-huh. uh, and I'm kind of capturing all the steps I'm taking, and it's awesome. Like, I'm reaching, like, 10,000 steps easy. And with this You look really tough. I'll just put that out. <laughs> <laughs> well, thank you. Um, but especially, like, in build, running around between oh, yeah. the, the expo floor and all the sessions and stuff. Like even now, I'm like at like seven thousand steps right now, and yep. we're not even like uh, halfway through the 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 day. I feel um, so. Just shouting out uh, my Fitbit, getting like out there and getting in shape, mm-hmm. and also just like PNW, like the Pacific Northwest hiking. Like I started doing that uh, a couple oh, yeah. weeks ago because it started being nice again. Uh-huh. I love hiking. I used to do that a lot in Israel. So just general hiking nature. I love that stuff. Yeah. Awesome. Okay, Gopi, how about you? Oh. I think it's the reverse story of Ori's. I was actually here until one, one and a half years ago, and then I just uh-huh. moved to India. Okay. And oh boy, now the May time frame is like super, super hot there. <laughs> right? It's like 43 degrees centigrade is what it'll hit. And I just uh-huh. landed here yesterday. It just felt so good back home, Seattle, uh-huh. because this is where I just lived long. 
right. in Microsoft, you know, before I moved to Microsoft India. Uh-huh. So coming back here feels like coming back home. Nice. It's like phenomenal place. The war, I don't know how many people will figure it out, but, you know, I just want to shout out to Seattle, you know, the weather here, the water, the air mm-hmm. quality is amazing. Yeah. I don't know, you know, you will find it in any other place. Like the purity of the Northwest yeah. particularly is like really, really nice. Yeah, I've I've been to Seattle a number of times. I have an aunt and uncle that used to live up in Bothell. I have an uncle that lives up in uh, Lake Stevens. And uh, it's, I swear, every time we come here, it rained more than half the time. <laughs> and it's been so gorgeous. The Just the, you know, the last couple of days has been nice. And so, yeah, I've, I've been enjoying it, like walking back and forth between the hotel and here. And it's it's been terrific. So, yeah, awesome. I'm, I'm going to back you on the Seattle picks because that's just <laughs> it's just been wonderful. So one last thing that I want to ask is um, if people want to find you online, where do they find you? Uh, do you have a blog, Twitter, GitHub, that kind of thing? People can find me on Twitter, Gopi Notch, G-O-P-I. N A C H. That's my Twitter handle. Okay. Yeah, and and my Twitter handle is uh, O R I Z H R. So that's Ori Zahir. Uh-huh. <laughs> kind of. Uh, yeah. That's awesome. It. Well, thanks for coming. It was fun to talk. Thank you. Some great guests, and uh, yeah, I think we have one more recording. So, folks, uh, stay tuned for the next few weeks, and we'll get those recordings out to you too. Thank you. Thank you. Bandwidth for this segment is provided by Cashfly, the world's fastest CDN. Deliver your content fast with Cashfly. Visit C-A-C-H-E-F-L-Y.com to learn more. <laughs>